Welcome to a new edition of the Famous Interviews with Joe Domino. On this episode, we talk with author, filmmaker, and performer Mark Laren Young. He's a wonderful interview, and we covered quite a bit, from surviving COVID to a great interview he had with the iconic author Kurt Vonnegut. And for most of his life, he has interviewed TV and movie stars, environmental leaders, politicians, and rock stars. He's also written several books about orcas and also an award-winning documentary, The 100-Year-Old Whale. His story is fascinating enjoy this interview it's joe domino how's how's it going dandy good, good. to hear from you joe you are yeah. precise man yeah you know i i've learned you know i uh i spent a lot of my 20s and 30s being late and i got sick of it oh i totally get that <laughs> so mark thanks for taking a minute out today i appreciate it Oh, this is great. I really appreciate you wanting to do this. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, before we get into your life, which is, there's so much great stuff going on, I want to know first and foremost how you survived COVID. Now that we're coming out of it, how did you survive that time period as a creative person? And how did it change you now that we're emerging out? It's interesting. I've been listening to a bunch of your interviews, and I love that that's something that you're focusing on. That you, cool. Because you, you know, because you keep coming back to COVID, and I think it changed all of us. And for me, I don't know. I really found myself drilling down on the projects that I cared most about. Right. It's, you know, it, it really forced you to reassess things. I had a life that suddenly went very virtual, and it's wild because I've always built my life around travel, and. Uh, Weirdly, COVID hit the one year I had actually made a plan not to travel at all because I had written the Orca exhibit. I'd, I'd written basically a million-dollar exhibit for the Royal BC Museum uh, on orcas. And I thought, you know what? How often am I going to need to do this in my life? I want to be there every day. I want to go through. I'm going to lead all the tours. It's going to be fantastic. So I had made a choice to say yes to uh, teaching at the University of Victoria, where I'd always taught one or two classes a year. And I said, you know what, you've always asked me to teach more classes. This year I will, because I just don't want to leave town. So I was very fortunate in that respect, that instead of having everything go sideways, I'd already planned for a year at home. The exhibit was, of course, zapped for that first year. The second year I ended up doing virtual tours and, you know, seeing this exhibit I'd worked on for years for the first time, wearing a mask and uh, doing the full-on mask thing and going through sort of in a secret private tour or sort of a private tour because I'd written it. But it was, it was odd, right? And reassessing travel, which has always been one of my huge priorities in life, right? If, you know, I suddenly had all the money in the world three years ago, I would have just gone, okay, where am I going now? Where am I going now? Where am I going now? And COVID suddenly made me go, okay, uh, this is home. I'm not planning to go anywhere now. Now what happens? So it's been a really fascinating ride. I've, I've really dug in more into my community and dug in more into projects that really matter to me. You know, it's interesting you mentioning that, you know, you'd already planned on staying around. It's almost as though the universe was smiling on you. Do you look back in retrospect and think, wow, what a what a fortunate thing to have happen? Well, in that respect, yeah. Uh, also, you know, because I'd already lined up gigs, that was kind of amazing. Because, again, my gigs are built on travel. I saw so much of my work vanish because I write TV and film, I had a play that was touring around the world that suddenly went from a whole bunch of live productions to a handful of Zoom productions. And, you know, well, it was lovely that some of my work happened on Zoom. Zoom is not theater. Uh, so, you know, in that respect, it was really, that part of it was really rough, but the fact that I actually had things that could pivot. Uh, I was teaching at UVic when the world shut down 
basically. So I did some of the earliest classes where students were on some system that sort of predated Zoom for universities. And what I saw so early on was how badly the students needed connection. And so the gig really started to become a privilege. I taught a class. Um, I taught a class in um, basically teaching storytelling, looking at the Marvel Universe and the DC Universe. And what I started to discover was that students wanted to stick around after the class and chat just to chat. And so I started going, hey, we're going to just hang out for as long as you want after class. We'll call it and ask me anything. And I would have students who would stay on for an hour or longer, and I'd just stop talking. And you know, they'd be saying, hey, we're sorry. We haven't talked to anybody other than like our parents all week. This is our only chance to connect with other humans. That was such a wild thing to be part of. And I don't think we're going to know for years how that affected all of us. I really don't. Right. You know, we've got, I, yeah. We've got a whole crop, we've got a whole crop of students who've never done things in the real, like, who are just now getting used to the idea of that they're not black screens. Right? It's yeah. a really wild thing. You know, it's interesting. My wife's a fifth grade teacher, and I work in a school district. I'm an IT technician, so I've watched a lot of this firsthand. And it's interesting, at one point, probably a year ago, there were kindergarten kids that came in and had masks on, and one of the teachers looked at me and said, imagine the fact that these kids don't know any other reality than to wear masks. And I'm sitting there as like a late 40s dude just like shaking my head thinking, wow, it's, it's wild to just because, you know, the people that were older during this pandemic, we had all of these years behind us. You know, we we could we had a relativity stick, and these kids don't. And and even you saying it's interesting that I asked that question first and foremost with COVID, but I think that really is the focal point as we move forward right now and just acknowledging it, even if it's quasi-therapeutic so that we can move forward and say, how has this affected me and what am I going to do from here? I think it's, I think it's necessary. Well, also, you know, socially, like on a really global scale, we've gotten used to the idea that we communicate in person the way we do in social media, right? Like everybody feels they're, not everybody, but there's, there's a sense for people that we're still invisible. And we've got to get out of that. Just globally, we've got to get out of the idea that we're invisible, that people can't see us. And, you know, it, it's fascinating, right? Yeah. Like this, was, this was just a wild social experiment. I also felt very fortunate uh, both to be in Canada through this, where there was a whole bunch of support that came out for people, yeah. but also to be a – I really, really fell in love with my community. Uh, because my wife's immunocompromised in the early going of COVID, we played it much safer than almost anybody else uh, because we did not know what would happen to her if, if she got sick. And we had so many friends who were like, no, we'll get your groceries. Don't worry about it. We'll, we'll pick up your stuff. Don't worry about it. And so we really dug into the idea of home, that this really is our home. So on that level, it was really life changing, and that was that part of it was really positive. Yeah. So there's so many irons that you have in the fire, and to simplify this for everybody out there to a certain degree, I'm going to ask you this: I'm going to put you in front of a, a group of kids at a grade school for career day, third graders, and I'm going to have one of them ask you, "What do you do for a living?" What's your answer going to be? I write. Um, like writer covers pretty much everything that I do, but. It's funny. I'm really selective, depending on who you put me in front of. So for little kids, I'll probably say, I write kids' books. I write about whales. I write about sharks, which is something that's, you know, kids' books are really actually quite new to me. That's something I've only done the last couple of years. But because I've always done so many different things, I've gotten used to the concept of whoever I'm talking to, I just go, okay, what might interest them? Like, you put me most places. I used to just say, I'm a journalist because it's easy and people understand that playwright. Not so much author people now get, uh, I read a lot of TV and film, but explaining what TV and film I write 
can take a while. So what I want to keep it easy, I just go, I'm a journalist, all right, for different places. So let's go back in your life when you were a kid. What did you dream about being when you grew up? Writer. It really was my thing. Uh, I just love, I've always loved telling stories. I've always loved making up worlds. And going all the way through school, I used to do, I used to do different things. I was, I was always sort of in the school plays and on the school paper. I was always do, I was always working as a journalist. I was always doing theater. Both parts of that were always my reality. And I think a lot of my best work is when those two blend, right? Like when I've done plays that have been based on real things or when I've done screenplays that have been based on reality and have been able to use the journalism skills and the research. And those combinations have always worked really well for me. So give me a slight zigzag from your childhood. How, how did you get these seeds of motivation to, to, to be as highly driven as you are to arrive where you're at right now? I realized it's funny because I think you really only see yourself when other when other people are pointing it out. Uh, I was uh, to me all of this is fun. Uh, writing things is I love trying different forms because it's like puzzles to me. I go okay, how do I put this together? How do I put this together? And how does this work? So I've done so many different kinds of writing and. I was in one of my lives. I was half of a comedy duo, and we toured Canada, toured the U.S., did a mix of political and environmental and topical comedy, and we were on tour in Toronto. And uh, I was sharing a place with my comedy partner, and we came back from the tour, and my agent asked what it was like on the tour, and he said, you know, I'd come back from doing a show, and he said, like, we'd come back from doing a show, and Kevin would go back to the room, and he'd unwind, he'd watch TV. I would go back to the hotel room, I wrote a new play. Because that was my idea of unwinding. Right? I relaxed by writing a new play. I relaxed by writing a new play. It wasn't me going, oh, I must work now. It was, I've got this cool idea, I want to work it out. So, as a writer, what what was that book for you, that part of the curtain, that made you either love reading or wanting to write? Oh, that's an easy one. It's Cat's Cradle, Kurt Vonnegut, Cat's Cradle. Um, because when I was in high school starting out, I actually had, my English teachers used to get frustrated with me because I wouldn't stay on track for assignments. I would really just do my own thing. They'd give me an assignment, I'd write, I'd have fun. And uh, they'd actually grade me down because I wouldn't really follow the directions, which is also something I've kind of stuck with for my entire life with writing. And then I read Cat's Cradle by Kurt Vonnegut and went, oh my God, you're allowed to write like you talk. It, like, it was just a revelation. Uh, yeah. Just the casual way he wrote. Uh, it was absolutely life-changing. And, but I mean, I've, you know, I've also talked about how really, you know, my introduction to writing was Marvel and DC Comics, right? I was hooked on both as a kid. So I got used to big epic stories and I got used to storytelling through that. And, you know, once you see those universes, you know how to build stories. So just a side note about Kurt Vonnegut, he will officially be a hundred years old on Veterans Day. And I interviewed a jazz musician, Jason Yeager, that built this suite commemorating him. And it's a really good album. So um, that's just a little trivia there. I, I had just seen that. Uh, one of my favorite interviews, one of the most amazing interviews I ever got to do was I actually got to interview Kurt Vonnegut. And it's the most intimidated I've ever been doing any interview. <laughs> I could barely eat before meeting him. Because I thought, oh, my God, I've read every one of his books. How do I talk to him and not, like, I feel like anything I ask, shouldn't I already know this since I've read his books? <laughs> I, I, I've, never, I've never been that intimidated for an interview before. And he was lovely and charming and doing his chain-smoking Paul Mall thing and was every bit who you'd want him to be. And I actually asked him a question he liked. So 
but I was a mess before the interview, right? I, I've interviewed I've interviewed so many people in my life, and I was so scared about the idea of interviewing him. <laughs> you, you know, in my twenties, I used to hang out with all my friends at a a Perkins, which was like a little restaurant to have coffee late into the night. And one of my friends told me a story about how someone drove up to his house in Cape Cod and knocked on his door like a high school kid and just wanted to ask him some questions and thought that he was going to get blasted off his porch, but he actually asked him the questions. So my friend would muse with us, let's come up with five really good questions and drive up there and just see what he does. Maybe he slams the door. Maybe he just has a cigarette with us, or he actually indulges us. But I remember that was one of the big things that we wanted to try to do. But I remember in the back of my mind thinking, man, this guy's a titan. You know, it's it's going to go one way or another, really good or really bad. And uh, I could imagine the intimidation of talking to someone like that would be pretty high. I remember when I – right before I started the university, I had a friend in the university – and he showed me that one of his friends had written a letter to Kurt Vonnegut and got this lovely long answer back. I thought, wow. Because wow. in my mind, he was the most famous writer in the world. Um, and the idea that he would write back to people just so amazing. Like, so yeah. amazing. Yeah, that just proves how cool he is. Um, and how genuine he is, too. Um, you know, every day you wake up, you have this vision of what you want to do. What is it that drives you every day? What is it that propels you to, to do what you do and to feel that motivation that takes in you? Well, it's been so interesting because so many things have shifted in terms of what I've what I write and what I've written over the last few years. And you know, one of the things that's been fascinating for me is that most people who meet me now are like, oh, you're, you're the orca guy because I've written so much about whales. And I'm like, no, no. I'm the, and people assume that I've got the science background because I've now written books about whales and books about sharks. I'm like, no, I have a comedy background. I just happened to stumble upon a whale story that blew my mind that I thought was a real-life science fiction story. That led to me writing about whales and then writing about sharks. And so much of it is like, I've got to get this information out. I've found this amazing story. I've got to tell this amazing story. So I was working on one whale story and discovered the story of somebody asked, do you know about the matriarch of the Southern Resident Orca? What's her story? She's 100 years old. I went, oh, I must write about that. Next thing I knew, I was writing a movie called The 100-Year-Old Whale, right, which was a documentary that I did. That wasn't me. I, I wasn't looking for that one. And it's funny. So many of my stories are ones that I've actually tried to give to somebody else because I've gone, I don't think I'm qualified to do this, right? So the story that took over my life almost 10 years ago now was the story of the first ever um, orc in captivity, Moby Doll. I wrote a book called The Killer Whale Who Changed the World. And basically... Before we met Moby Doll in 1964, uh, people thought killer whales were monsters. People tried to kill them. People shot them, you know, shot them on sight. Um, oh, oh have, we, have I lost you? No, you got me. I'm good. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, so, like, people would shoot them on sight. They were considered monsters. And suddenly, basically, in a span of days, uh, the whole perception changed. I went, oh, wow. This is a real life science fiction story. Um, and just, I went to so many people and said, I found this great story. I found these great characters. Can somebody please make a documentary about these people before they die? Uh, I never imagined that person would be me. I just said, you know, can somebody do this? Maybe I'll write it. And next thing I knew, that became my thing. So, yeah, it really is me just finding a story that, I can't get out of my mind. Yeah. And that's, that's how it, that's what happens. It's, it's the good rabbit hole for sure. Um, you know, we, sometimes we're only as good as those that we model or we're around that inspire us. Who's been that hero for you, that person that you admire? I heard you ask this question. I've been, I've been listening to catching up on a bunch of your podcasts. And I thought, really, the person I go back to is a Canadian director 
who passed away several years ago. His name was John Giuliani, and he was very much my mentor. He's somebody I was lucky enough to work with on several plays and dramas, and he was just... Uh, he was one of Canada's first sort of alternate theater directors and he loved doing things that would provoke controversy and spark fights. And although that was, which meant that every time I worked with him, I seemed to get in some degree of trouble and I had endless fun and just, he was so fearless and I am still, um, I'm still sort of great friends with his wife. I was just talking to her last night, but it'll be John. And I, I don't know how much he pops in the Wikipedia age, but did so many amazing things in the Canadian theater scene uh, and was one of the top radio drama producers. I mean, there, I, I was going, I should probably come up with somebody super famous for you, but John, John's my guy. So, You've had the fortunate, you know, no position in life to interview a lot of esteemed people that none of us will ever have the chance to talk to or meet, like Kurt Vonnegut. So I'm going to ask a twofold question to you. First of all, who was that one person that you interviewed that you can't get out of your mind that did something that transformed the way that you viewed interviews? And who on the planet right now that's alive would you love to interview that you haven't? Wow. Those are two great questions. Weirdly, the person who, who pops to mind, who transformed the way I did interviews, was not one of my more famous interviews. He was a, a lawyer and judge in Canada named Tom Berger, and he transformed the way I wrote because he was the most thoughtful person I think I'd ever interviewed. He couldn't answer a question without pausing. And you could, like, see the gears turning. And what was transformative for me was I thought, oh, how in the world do I get across what he did in this interview? How in the world do I get across how seriously he took each question? And so I wrote the interview. It's one of, I think it's one of the best written interviews I ever did because I basically went, he paused, and then I just went back to the recorder and went, he paused for 35 seconds before answering the question. And it transformed the way I wrote as a playwright and as a screenwriter because I went, oh, that's how long people really pause when they're being thoughtful. And I really started to listen to the way people talked, the way people stop and start their sentences. And I wrote a piece a few year, years later called The Green Chain, which was my first feature film. And uh, I wrote and directed it. And it's a mock documentary, except not in the comedic way. It's a straight up um, series of monologues that I scripted. And I wrote it using that sort of modeling. I wrote it with the pauses in, with the stop starts. And people were so sure it was a real documentary that there were fights at festivals about whether it was real or not. It was fascinating. And that style has always stuck with me. So that's the interview that comes up. Uh, who would I love to interview? Wow. Uh, I think Obama would be fascinating. I think the Dalai Lama, Jane Goodall. I keep all... I almost got to Judy Jane Goodall. I was wanted her for my documentary, and she was in Victoria. And I had a chance at a phone interview, but I really wanted to film her for the documentary and thought, oh, I'll pull that off another time, and that's not going to happen. So although she may film something for my doc, but um, this is the documentary I'm finishing on the killer whale of the world. But those are three that popped to mind. But so many people. I, I love asking people questions. It's so much fun, as you know. Yeah, absolutely. It sure, it sure is. So, you know, let me ask you this. For all of the things that you've written in your life, what's the one thing you lean back in the easy chair and think, man, I really am so happy that I did that? <sighs> 
wow, it kind of changes really, like really and truly it changes in different mediums. Uh, the piece that I've ended up having the most adventures with, so I think it wins just on, just for that alone, is I wrote a play called Shylock, which is a one-man show about a Jewish actor who gets in trouble for playing uh, Shylock in Merchant of Venice. And basically he's accused of being anti-Semitic for playing Shylock in Merchant of Venice. I wrote this in the 90s. This play has toured the world. Uh, the experience that makes me go, yeah, this, this just wins, was it was translated into Czech. I got to go see this play in Prague. Uh, the production in Prague was a phenomenon on a level that I've, I've never experienced before because the actor who was cast was Václav Havel's Minister of Culture and had run for the, and was, ran for the president of Slovakia. So he was famous there on a level that was just, I don't know what the comparable would be, but basically, yeah, it would, well, it would be as if a prime minister or president decided, hey, I'm going back on stage after 10 years. So the production was a phenomenon. The president of the Czech Republic was at the opening. The place was filled with all sorts of people. And the play in, the play ends with the one piece, with one piece that's sort of semi-autobiographical, which is about my great grandfather uh, basically being taken away from his family by Cossacks, uh, actually in the Ukraine. And he came back to the house. Nobody ever knew what had happened to him. But after that, my family, my great grandparents immigrated to Canada. And it, there's a segment about this in the play. And I'm telling you this for a reason, because in Canada and the U.S., and this has been performed all over Canada and the U.S., that's like, it's a good story. What I didn't realize, and I didn't realize for days, was I went to the opening night of this play, the play is packed, everybody is, like I said, this is the who's who of the Czech Republic. And for the last five minutes of play, the audience is bawling, just bawling. And I'm going, what is going on here? This has never happened this place. And nobody involved with the, with the play spoke terrific English, but the designer was from Germany, sort of explained what's going on. He said, you've written an Eastern European play. And I went, what do you mean? He said, everybody in this audience has somebody who was taken away by Russia. He said, that's why they're all crying. And apparently this happened every night of a run that went on for off and on for four years. So I look at that and go, wow, that's, that's the one I kind of sit back, but it, it's very weird. Going, I, the, the transformative thing for me was seeing this play resonate in a language I do not speak or understand and connect with these people in such an astonishing way. So I go with Shylock for that reason. So let's say you have a dream tonight and you run into your younger version in your 20s and you can give your younger version a piece of advice based on what you've learned, the wisdom you've gained throughout your life. What would you tell your younger version? Wow. Have fun. Don't take it all so seriously. Something like that. Right? Like all of this is supposed to be fun. Yeah. Absolutely. So... Everyone has a perception of you. You've, you've, you've been in so many different capacities. You know, your family, your friends, you know, colleagues, you know, clients. But, you know, ultimately you've lived your life. You have a perception of you. Who do you think you are? I really do tend to just come back to writer and storyteller. And it's interesting. I've gone through a whole bunch of various incarnations and various different gigs and uh, the 
wildest thing that I did recently was actually just ran for public office. I ran, which again, came out of the pandemic. Never would have done that if it for the pandemic. I ran for, um, for uh, municipal council in Saanich, which is the community I live in. And that was a fascinating ride because it's like, oh, wow, my ethics kind of stay consistent no matter what the gig is, the, which, which was interesting to see. Right, because you don't know until you're put into a situation like that, and because I've done so many, I think being a journalist lands you in all sorts of odd situations, and you start to see what you'll do when you end up in an odd situation. I wrote a, uh, I, my first really successful book was a comic memoir called Never Should Have Stand Queen, and it was about being a reporter in the Caribou, uh, which is cowboy country in, in BC and in Canada. And I kept ending up in dangerous situations and I just kind of kept consistent to me. Uh, I guess is the best way to put it. Like my ethics just weren't, I realized my ethics really aren't situational, uh, which I feel really good about. So, What's been the best fan letter, fan response, client response you've ever gotten from your work that always resonates with you that you remember? Okay. Uh, interesting that I just mentioned Stampede Queen because the one that really stuck, like I'm thinking of some funny ones, but the one that really sticks in my mind was um, from uh, an email from um, a young indigenous woman who said that until she read my book, Never Should a Stampede Queen, she never really understood what her mother's life was like. Uh, because I wrote about basically discrimination in Canada. Like for all the fact that the book actually won a Leacock, won something called the Leacock Medal for Humor for the funniest book in Canada that year. Uh, but there were a lot of very serious segments. And a lot of the more serious segments were about discrimination in small town BC and she wrote this beautiful email saying that she read the book and went oh wow uh, now I know what my mom went through now I understand and the idea that it connected on that level has just always stayed with me that that particular that particular email just really always stuck with me so Mark if anyone out there wants to learn more about what you're doing, pick up your books, you know, anything related to your life and your world, where's the best place for them to go? Uh, I've got my own website, larryandyoung.com. Uh, the Wikipedia page on me is, like, startlingly accurate at the moment anyway. Uh, but larryandyoung.com has links to most of my stuff. And if you Google me, uh, L-E-I-R-E-N hyphen Y-O-U-N-G, you'll find me out there and if there's something anybody else wants to ask me I am so easy to find on social media and I'm happy to answer questions from people like you know hey if Kurt Vonnegut can do it absolutely for sure Mark this has been great man thank you for opening up good luck with everything I appreciate it thank you so much thank you so much for doing what you do I'm, I'm I really enjoy your stuff Joe and never would have expected to be interviewed on a podcast that says it's neon jazz but you really do so many other things it's kind yeah. of awesome <laughs> thank you man you too man it's uh, yeah i i'm i'm bespectacled by what you do as well so it's so great to hook up with you thanks for the kind words and i'm i'm a huge fan of your work as well so thank you very much man all right take care Thanks for tuning in to another famous interview with Joe Domino, where we cover the world of art, literature, business, and music from around the globe. If you want to hear more interviews, visit the Famous Interviews with Joe Domino channel on YouTube. Thanks again for listening, and until next time.